Nintendo's Amiibo figures look great as they are, but customizing is a way of making them even more special. I'm TJ, and it's my mission to make the map that removes the mystery from Amiibo to help you chart the course to conquer your favorite custom challenges and achieve the unique and personalized Amiibo you always wanted. Let me make the mistake so you don't have to. Somebody call for a hero? Who even watches this show? That's me, TJ, and Dark TJ. They'll be popping up from time to time to offer some tips, tricks, and helpful hints. Don't listen to anything this guy has to say. He has no idea what he's doing. Or not so helpful. It's dangerous to go alone, so come with us and we'll conquer this custom together. Welcome to Custom Conquest. Hey everybody, we're back again. I'm really glad you're joining us here today. The customs that we're gonna feature today are from my all-time favorite Legend of Zelda game, Majora's Mask. But Breath of the Wild is giving it a serious run for its rupees. The only way Breath of the Wild could be any more awesome is if Majora's Mask was actually in it. Now, I I'm not gonna lie. There were points during the process of making these customs where I really started to question my ability to actually do them. They, I, I reached the height of frustration. There were times where I almost even wanted to quit and not even continue with them. There were times where I felt so demoralized, I just wanted to smash my creations with a hammer. But I am thrilled, relieved, and proud to say that we powered through, uh, we got through all of those difficult trials and emerged victorious on the other side, and we have created all the transformation forms from the Majora's Mask in the game, well, Majora's Mask. It's so epic that even though I originally intended to put all of them into just this one episode, it is going to be a two-parter. So you're gonna get the first three transformation masks today. That's gonna be our Deku Link, Zora Link, and then our Goron Link. And we'll follow up with a few other cool ones next time, but more on that later. Today, let's focus on those transformation forms that allow you to explore the world of Termina through a different pair of eyes. Let's get started. Let's measure these three transformation forms on our custom conquest difficulty scale. Deku Link is not gonna stretch it too far because most of the work was already done for us. However, Goron Link and Zora Link pushed me to the limits of my abilities. Yes, they are a nine, and I might even go so far as to say they're the most difficult customs you're gonna see me attempt here on the show. All right, so let's arm you with what you're gonna need to be able to complete this quest, starting with the components, which includes the figures, pieces, and parts. The first item on our list here is the Ocarina of Time Link Amiibo. And I did use this as the foundation for all three figures, even though two of them didn't involve any Ocarina of Time Link pieces. So it is worth mentioning here, at the time that I created these customs, there was no Majora's Mask Amiibo available. Nintendo has since announced a Young Link Amiibo based on Majora's Mask, but as of the time of this video's release, it has not yet hit the market. But I mention it because at least for two out of the three Amiibo, I feel like that might be a better option. Next up on this list is the Jack Pacific 2.5 inch Deku Link figure. Hey, have you ever actually seen the package? <laughs> They don't even know how to spell Link. The figure's based on probably the most recognizable piece of key art of Deku Link from Majora's Mask, and the sculpt is really dead on. The next item on our list is a Disney Infinity Mr. Incredible figure. This super dad's gonna be the base that I build on for most of Goron Link. We've got another Disney Infinity figure here, the Norse God of Thunder, Thor. I picked this guy up used from GameStop for super cheap, and to be honest, I didn't really have any designs on him. But as I got to work on Goron Link, I was really glad I had him, because he wound up making a lot more significant contributions than I expected. Hey, guess what? We got another Disney Infinity figure for you. Tonto from the Lone Ranger. Hi ho, Epona! Away! Most people look at this figure and they see the Lone Ranger sidekick. Or yet another version of Johnny Depp in Disney Infinity form. But for me, it was screaming Zora Link. And before we move on to the other side, there is one more figure that I want to mention. Let me guess, another discontinued Disney Infinity figure? Uh, yeah, actually. This time we're taking a look at Tinkerbell. I'm actually not going to utilize any of the figure at all, but there are a couple key components here that we are going to put to some good use. All right, let's check out the equipment that will cover the tools and supplies. Keep in mind, this is really just an overview because to put some of these together, I really had to dig deep into my inventory and use just about every tool in my arsenal. The first item on this list is a handrail, and there's really no getting around it. If you want to create these figures with any degree of structural security, you are going to need to have some way to be able to make some clean holes. Along that same train of thought, we're going to use some paper clips and super glue. These are going to work hand in hand with the handrail. The paper clips are going to provide some structural support, and the super glue is going to lock everything into place. Now let's talk a little bit about some sculpting putty and sandpaper. Surprisingly, there wasn't really a whole lot of sculpting involved, but once we fit all the pieces into place, things are going to be pretty patchy, and the sculpting putty is going to be necessary to fill in those gaps. There was a lot of sanding going on. Like a day's worth! In addition to refining the sculpting putty after it's set, I had to refine a lot of existing plastic. Next up, we got some rubber bands and a leather punch. The rubber bands are going to help us get some nice clean edges. We're going to use the leather punch to make some perfect circles. And for those of you guys who know me and know my work, you know I keep coming back to these plastic sporks. Well, they're going to make an appearance in this episode too. And the last thing I want to mention 
mention is paint, brushes, and a sealer. Just another quick heads up, I'm gonna pull some random pieces from here and there, but we'll address those on a piece by piece basis as we encounter them in the construction process. Just like Link's adventure through Termina required him to utilize the skills of three completely different masks to achieve such radically different appearances, we're gonna assemble some completely different parts. So we're gonna cover each one of these customs individually, starting with our Deku Link. As I mentioned, Jack Specific gave us this gorgeous gift of a 2.5 inch Deku Link figure. Better than a Hestu's gift. <laughs> The scale is amazing, the sculpt is amazing, but what it is not is an amiibo. So that's really what most of this process is going to be. I used the Ocarina of Time Link amiibo because at the time it was the closest thing to a Majora's Mask amiibo and because there's only two small holes left in the base. And while the Majora's Mask amiibo has not released yet, so obviously I haven't done any detailed deconstruction, I highly suspect that it would work just as well or probably better in this case. The only other piece I wanna add is that Tinkerbell we talked about, but all I'm gonna borrow from her is her little leaf platform. I think the leaf lends itself really well to Deku Link, and it also creates a very easy solution for covering up the holes left in the base from removing the figure. If I have any criticism of the Jack specific figure, it's that the colors are pretty flat and very saturated. So most of the work here is gonna go into trying to bring those colors down and then simply just attaching him to the base. That sounds easy enough, now for the tricky stuff. Goron Link really did become somewhat of a Frankenstein monster and I pulled pieces from all over the place. I started off with my Ocarina of Time Link base because I do want him to be a part of the Zelda collection, but actually no part of that figure itself made it into the final product. I did borrow the cap from Smash Toon Link because I had an extra one on hand, but if you don't have one of those, there's all kinds of different solutions for that. Mr. Incredible is gonna be the foundation, and every other piece is gonna be applied to him. I didn't originally intend to use Thor at all, but I wound up liking the proportions of his arms and boots a little better than Mr. Incredible's, so we're gonna be doing some part swapping there. And you're probably wondering what that mini Elsa Funko Pop figure's doing there. You know, this head was such a nightmare for me. I started over three times. There was definitely some serious drama-rama around here for a while where I was having some major mantrums. <laughs> It was hilarious! But we totally survived it, we got through it, and I'll cover it in all the gory details in the next section. And for our final transformation figure, let's take a look at Zora Link. There was never any point where I expected this guy was gonna be easy. In fact, I found him to be the most intimidating because of the paint job. Having to achieve a color gradient of such dramatically different shades isn't really in my wheelhouse and doesn't lend itself very well to my skills, so I was already planning to hunker down. Of the three transformation forms, this was the only one where I actually used elements from the Ocarina of Time Link amiibo. He'll provide the lower half of the body, and then for the head and torso, I'm gonna see how much I can reshape this Disney Infinity Tonto figure. The biggest obstacle here is the piece obscuring his chest because Zora Link doesn't wear anything like that. So rather than have to build up on anything, it's really gonna be more a process of removal. I predict a lot of sanding in our future. And then finally for those fins, we're gonna pluck a pair of fairy wings. You know, that's something I never understood about Disney fairies. Even though they have wings, they need pixie dust to fly. And if it's raining, they can't fly even with pixie dust because their wings are wet. But humans don't have wings and they could fly with pixie dust, rain or shine. You've given this entirely too much thought. All right, let the adventure begin. It's a good thing I didn't have the moon looming over me threatening to destroy the world in three days because completing these took a lot longer than that. Let's kick things off with our Deku Link transformation form. Hats off to the artists over at Jack Specific. This is, in my opinion, one of their best looking figures. They really nailed the design. One thing you may notice is that very little of the figure is actually painted. Most of the pieces are molded out of their respective colors, which is really great in terms of durability, but this particular plastic has a really inauthentic sheen. It's very bright and saturated, and aside from his face, doesn't really have any shading or highlight value to speak of. So the first thing I want to do to grunge this guy up a bit is to give him a wash in a really thinned out brown acrylic paint. While the appearance of the Deku Link, Goron Link, and Zora Link don't really have much in common, I do want their color scheme to be cohesive. And one way to do that is to make sure that the shades of green match. Now I could prime this little guy, and you may want to, depending on how much you enjoy painting, but I don't really feel like it's necessary. Since I'm painting the plastic the same color it already is, coverage isn't really much of an issue here. I'll cover his cap in green, as well as his skirt. You can lock his limbs into place with some super glue if you're not precious about preserving his posability. The figure has very limited articulation as it is, so it doesn't really bother me much. Fairies lend a little bit of a helping hand to Link in most of the Zelda games, including Majora's Mask, and Tinkerbell's gonna help us out right here. We're gonna start by throwing her in the boiling water to soften her up and make her a little bit easier to pull away from the base. I've customized a lot of Amiibo, but this was really my first go at deconstructing a Disney Infinity figure, and I have to say a lot more attention was put into preventing them from being pulled apart. I guess that's great if you're giving them to five-year-old kids, but for my purposes, 
and potentially yours, they're actually really difficult to disassemble. Fortunately, the plastic is also very durable, so it can hold up to quite a bit of pulling and prying. I recommend a pair of round nose pliers. If you do ding them up during deconstruction, there's a good chance you can restore most of that by putting it back into the boiling water for just a few seconds. I don't care what you gotta do, just leaf me out of it. Now that I've got my leaf, I'm gonna patch the hole in the middle with some putty and then prime it. I'll start by painting it up with a standard green color, and then I'm gonna take that color down with some thin brown. Then all we have left to do is attach a Deku link to the leaf, and then attach the leaf to the base. To ensure the utmost security, I'm gonna run a screw through the platform, through the leaf, and then into the foot of Deku link. Don't forget to pre-drill with your hand drill. One down, two to go. Brace yourself, this next one's gonna be rough. Let's start with our base figure, Disney Infinity's Mr. Incredible. Toss him into the boiling water. I found this figure to be extremely tightly connected. Pulling him apart proved very difficult, and I did have to return to the boiling water several times to keep him malleable. I even had to use my X-Acto knife at some of the connection points to try to separate the glue. There's no reason to take the figure completely apart. All I have to do is separate him from the base and then remove his arms. Hey, want to see Mr. Incredible with a full head of hair? Hehe, <laughs> that looks <laughs> so dumb. Quit wasting time. Next, I want to throw my Disney Infinity Thor figure into the boiling water. God of Thunder! Disassembling Thor was a war. An infinity war? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, these figures are really tightly fit together, and the glue is really persistent. The saving grace is that the plastic is very strong, and it will hold up to quite a bit of pulling and prying. Don't be afraid to go back to the pot half a dozen times or more if you need to, because I know I did. Wow, after a battle like that, you're probably going to be pretty Thor. <laughs> At first, I had every intention of using Mr. Incredible's boots, but I started to get the sense as I was going that perhaps they weren't bulky enough for Goron Link. So that's what first led me to Thor. I'm going to use my X-Acto knife to flatten out the bottom of the boot, and then I'm going to separate the boot from the foot right above the ankle, and then I'll repeat the process on the Mr. Incredible figure. I'm already imagining this is going to be a pretty heavy figure, and I've already significantly compromised the base. So to ensure that it's going to be able to support the weight, in addition to super gluing, I'm going to drill a hole in Mr. Incredible's leg, plug it with a paperclip, trim it to length, and cap the end with Thor's boot. While I really like Mr. Incredible's big bulky arms, they're not really true to the proportions of Goron Link. So to find a better option, I didn't really need to look any further than my Thor figure. His biceps are more realistically sculpted, and the definition is a bit better. All around, the upper arm more closely resembles the way that Goron Link looks in the game. But I'm not really loving on Thor's forearms or hands, so I'm gonna see about going back to Mr. Incredible for those. I'm gonna employ the same process that I used to attach the boots, and drill the arm, and fill the hole with a paperclip. Mr. Incredible's fists are gonna work great, but I still needed to find a better bracer solution. I started scoping out my workspace, hoping to come across something that would fit the bill, and then I found these two crazy glue containers. That's crazy! <laughs> I tested it out to see if I liked the fit, and it wasn't half bad. I found that if I flipped it around and used the backside, the fit was actually kind of perfect. So I separated the container at the appropriate length. Don't worry if you don't get a perfect edge, you can always just sand it flat when you're done. I'm gonna add a hole in the crazy glue container so that I can feed it onto the paperclip. Then I'm gonna cap the end off with Mr. Incredible's fist. For my first attempt at Goron Link's head, I thought I might actually use an extra Deku Link. My idea was I'd just pull the head completely apart, and I'd be left with more or less just a basic circle that I could build upon. I even imagined I could repurpose the hair to kind of wrap around in more the style of Goron Link's. That hair looks like a bunch of bananas! I gave Deku Link a haircut in hopes that it would suit the style of Goron Link. I quickly discovered that Deku Link's head isn't really oblong enough for Goron Link, so I turned to a Mii Fighter figure's hair. I thought if I just sanded down the two little bumps on top, it would provide a pretty decent base to build on for Goron Link's face. At this point, I'm pretty convinced of the scale, so I'm just gonna remove Mr. Incredible's head to create some space. Goron Link doesn't wear a full skirt because his backside is, well, mostly boulders, but he does have this tattered loincloth in the front. For this, I'm gonna use Thor's cape. I'll draw out the shape with a marker and then cut it out with my X-Acto knife. Then I'll just refine the edges until I get the perfect fit. The design of Goron Link's boots and bracers is very distinct, so the chances of finding something that resembles it is not terribly likely. I reconciled myself relatively early on to the fact that I was going to have to construct it, but I wanted to do it in the cleanest and easiest way possible. Both the boots and the bracers incorporate a lot of trim, so I needed a material of various sizes with very clean edges and a high degree of adjustability. For this, rubber bands were an ideal solution. They're cheap to acquire, very easy to cut, and they respond really well to super glue. One of the bands on Goron Link's bracers has an alternating step pattern. For this, I just cut small squares out of the rubber band at equal intervals. I spent a little time messing around with Goron Link's head, testing various pieces here and there to make sure I got the proportions right, and to see what would work. At first it was a process of just testing different elements, and then as I found things I was satisfied with, I glued them down. My first crack at it involved some repurposed pieces of hair from the extra Deku Link figure. I flattened out the Ocarina of Time Link's hair for some bangs. I've got Toon Link's cap, a little random plastic chunk I cut out for the nose, and then I trimmed out some random rounded plastic to provide some eyes. I also added some rubber band eyebrows. 
course. For the studs on Goran Link's bracers and boots, it's a really simple shape and it can be sculpted easily, but it was really important to me that they were clean and uniform in scale. So for this, I combined a leather punch with a plastic spork. I punched out a few dozen of these little things, but because they were so small, I couldn't really handle them with my fingers. So the application method that I had the most success with was applying a small dab of glue to the rubber band, stabbing my little plastic circle with the X-Acto knife, and then pressing it onto the dab of glue. To make sure I didn't have any bubbles or raised edges from the super glue, I smoothed things out with a toothpick. Admittedly, this process was pretty time consuming, but it did ensure a high degree of precision. For the raised portion on the back of Goron Link's glove, I trimmed a rubber band into shape, and then just stuck it on with some super glue. I created cuffs for the top of the boots in the exact same way that I did for the bracers, including the plastic spork studs. For Goron Link's facial hair, I went back to my custom amiibo scrapyard and found a spare piece of hair from the back of a Smash Brothers Link figure. I trimmed it up with my X-Acto knife and then glued it into place. I mentioned earlier in the episode that most of the sculpting would be limited to patchwork, and that's mostly true. The one major exception being Goron Link's gut. Don't forget his moobs! And the rocks on his back! You're not really gonna strain yourself too much here, it's just a series of various sized spheres. I'll just roll out some round balls of putty and slap them onto Goron Link's midsection, then smooth them out with some water. I'll do the same thing for his pectorals. Moobs! And I'm also gonna iron out the seam between his shoulder and his torso. I played around a little adding some putty details to his face, but because they proved to be ultimately fruitless, I won't go into too much detail with that right here. I felt like the top of his boots could use a little bit of buildup as well, so I just dropped a little lump there and smoothed it out. And as of this point, I wasn't completely sure about the angle of his left arm, so I didn't permanently attach it. I also filled in the gaps of Goron Link's hair. I wanted to use a thinner rubber band for Goron Link's boot trim, so I couldn't find one thick enough, which meant that I had to add each piece of the pattern separately. Again, this took a lot of time, but that's what it took to get the look I wanted. The most unique aspect of the Goron Link transformation is his ability to roll, like a rock. His back pretty much is a rock. Rock and roll! <laughs> for this, I built a bunch of little putty balls and just popped them into place one at a time. I used a Tomi Gacha figure Goron from Phantom Hourglass for reference. What are you making over there, a ninja turtle? Cowabunga, dude! It is probably a bit much, I'll tone it down. Once I found the rock pattern that I liked, I smoothed it out with water. After all my putty set, I primed Goron Link with a light spray gray, and then to maintain maximum smoothness, and because so much of his body is one color, I decided for my base coat I would use spray paint. Up to this point, I've been pretty pleased with Goron Link's progress. I'll start detailing out his face by adding some black to his eyes, and while I'm at it, I'll hit his eyebrows as well. So I'll paint a blue crescent shape, and then add the black pupil back on. And as the final detail for the eye, I'll add a little white highlight. I'll paint his hair white, including his soul patch. You call that a soul patch? This is a soul patch. Control yourselves, ladies. I'll pinken up Goron Link's lips. I'm gonna use a leather brown color to paint his boots, as well as his bracers. I wanted to roughen up Goron Link's rocks, so I scuffed him with some sandpaper. And then to darken the grooves and add some value, I washed them with a thinned out brown acrylic. And for his loincloth, I'm gonna use the same green that I used on my Deku Link. For the trim on Goron Link's boots and bracers, I mixed up a burnt orange color. Which required like a million coats. This part was a pain. To achieve the kind of coverage I wanted, it did take three or four coats. And because it did involve painting around some pretty tight corners, it was slow goings. I needed to keep the paint thin because I wanted it to be smooth, and I didn't want there to be any visible brush strokes, so my only real option was patience and persistence. Goran Link has these really cool tattoos on his upper arms that have some really sharp edges, and I just didn't trust myself to paint it, so I cut the center section out of electrical tape, and then I drew the outer portion with a fine tip sharpie. There's this insanely rare series of figures based on Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, which include Link mounted on Epona, Deku Link, Goron Link, and Zora Link. I was never aware of their existence at the time they came out, and you really can't get them anymore unless you're willing to shell out something like $250 each, but I was able to track down some photos of the figures which really helped me to imagine a physical three-dimensional version of these characters. For Goron Link, I even superimposed an image of my custom head on top of the head of the figure just to try to make sure that my proportions were exactly correct. While it did seem to line up, I don't know, something about it just still seemed off. So after reaching the final stages and investing, I don't even know how many hours, I came to the realization that I was never going to be happy with my Goron Link's head. So I very calmly and very carefully detached the head and began some thoughtful meditation on what would get me closer to achieving my goals. I was dissatisfied with the placement, the proportions, and the paint job. Seriously though, at this point I was starting to question whether or not I actually possessed the ability to be able to achieve a custom that I would be pleased with. I had just gotten so far along in the process that it was really discouraging at this point to have such a monumental setback. I pretty much needed to rebuild the head from scratch. Uh, do you think maybe you should slow down and take a few deep breaths? No, 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 don't listen to him. You got the right idea. Keep after it. I still see some stuff you haven't broken yet. 
<laughs> it was the low point for this project and I felt really defeated. I was frozen with despair. It took the wisdom of a four-year-old to give me the courage to power through. My daughter's really something special. We work on a lot of art together and she really loves helping me with my custom projects. And I have to say her contribution on this one is what got me through to the end. She saw how frustrated I was and she said, Daddy, let it go. And you know what? She was right. At some point she got these little frozen pop Funko minifigures. I don't even really remember where they came from and they'd since been relegated to the forgotten corners of the toy box. So let's give these old toys some new life. Do you wanna build a Goron? Let it go before I kick the living Hestu's gift out of you. I'm really happy with the placement of the eyes and the nose. All I gotta do is add the hair and the mouth. I repurposed a pair of clown car lips that were much too big and I sanded for ages. Back to the Amiibo Custom Parts Scrapyard, and what do I come up with but a bunch of Bowser Jr. ponytails. If you saw any part of last season, you know at least eight episodes were dedicated to Bowser Jr., and not all of them required his hair, so I've got quite a few of these left on hand, and by splitting some of them in half and rotating them around, I used Bowser Jr.'s ponytail to create not only the whiskers on the side of Goron Link's face, but also his bangs. Rather than attempt to sculpt Goron Link's necklace, I picked up a bead necklace from a hobby shop that's the color and scale I like. All I need to do here is trim it to length. With the help of a thick rubber band to help transition the cap, and some sculpting putty, we've managed to right the ship. Nah, you're thinking a Wind Waker! Get your game straight! Now for the second time, I'm gonna paint Goron Link's hair white, I'll paint his cap green, instead of using the rubber bands for the eyebrows and the plastic for the eyes, I'm gonna use some electrical tape. And to ensure that my eyes are perfect circles, I'm gonna cut them out with my leather punch. This time I decided I would paint the eye before I applied it, that way if I made a mistake or I wasn't happy with it, I could just try again without getting any collateral paint spill onto my figure's face. I also wanted to create these nostrils, so I cut out the tiniest triangle that I could possibly achieve. I used a tweezer to move it into the position and then a toothpick to poke it into place. I'm gonna use a pretty pale pink to add some life to Goron Link's lips. For the brown circles on Goron Link's chest, you mean his nipples? I used my leather punch to pop a small circle out of the electrical tape. You can use brown electrical tape if you got it, but I didn't, so I just painted it brown. To give this Goron guy a little bit more of a rugged look, I brushed on a really thin brown acrylic to highlight some of those small details. With the painting complete, I covered him in some Mod Podge matte. And because of his size, he's spilling over the side of an amiibo base, so I'm gonna attach him to the platform of the Disney Infinity Thor figure. I'll prime it with a light gray, and then give it some dimension with a dark gray wash. And just like with our Deku Link, I'm gonna pin it to the amiibo platform with a screw. Alright, time to take on the third transformation form. You ready? Unlike the other two, for this one we are actually going to use our Ocarina of Time Link Amiibo figure in a meaningful way. So I'm gonna drop him in the boiling water. This will soften him up, make him pretty easy to pull apart. Although his legs are made from a more rigid plastic than the rest of his body, no amount of heating is gonna soften it. If you expose it to too much heat for too long, it'll start to melt, which might warp the shape a little bit, so be aware of that. In this case, I don't need to do anything to manipulate the shape of the legs, so I'll just leave them as is. I'm gonna detach the boots, cause it's gonna make them easier to work with. The other key component is our Disney Infinity Tonto figure. You've already seen at least three times so far. When it comes to deconstruction, these Disney Infinity figures are resistant participants. So let's see how much cooperation we can coax out of Tonto. Let's start by giving him a nice warm bath. Now that the plastic is supple, we can pull the pieces apart. I don't have any of the Disney Infinity games, and preserving the NFC chips for these figures was never really one of my considerations. But just as a curiosity, I wanted to see how difficult it would be to access them. Turns out, it's really, really shaking hard. There was really no polite way to get in here. Heat treatment didn't really have any effect on the plastic, and even tearing at it with pliers was only marginally effective. Ultimately, I wound up attacking it with a hacksaw. A hacksaw! We're not joking. I sawed away at the area between the character's platform and the clear plastic, which finally granted me access to the NFC chip. For those of you who are interested to know, it does still register as an NFC chip. While I didn't check it in Disney Infinity, if I scan it into Smash Brothers, it's quickly identified as unsupported, but it's clearly still being read. While Tonto came apart agreeably enough, disassembly isn't really one of the biggest considerations here. His right arm and his torso both have fairly large portions that I need to remove. To do this, I'm gonna approach this problem with an X-Acto knife, and I'm gonna wear a heavy work glove to protect my fingers. To keep the figure soft and make the cutting job a little bit easier, I occasionally drop him back into the boiling water for 30 seconds or so. As I shave away the plastic, I make sure to leave a little bit of a ledge so that the chest sticks out more than the abdominal area. Once I completely cut off all the excess plastic, I'm gonna spend a lot of time sanding to make it smooth. If you want to expedite the process, you can start with a rough grain and then transition into a fine grain to get it as smooth as possible. We're gonna get another special fairy visit from our friend Tinkerbell. Hey, I just remembered! Peter Pan was one of the original inspirations for Link. That's pretty cool. I'm gonna cut the smaller wings on the bottom off with my X-Acto knife because we really only need the upper portion for the fin. I don't really know what to call these pieces, the fish ears. 
ocean mullet. Uh, fin sideburns? Well, anyway, I'm gonna trim a small strip off the wing of the bird that Tonto wears on his head. Tonto's head already has a lot going for it to convert into Zora Link, but I need his eyes to slant on an upward angle. So I'm gonna create two small incisions with my X-Acto knife and then see if I could just remove that small wedge of plastic. I was actually kind of dreading this because I was predicting a very high probability of failure, but it worked really well and was a lot easier than I thought. Tonto's torso connects to his legs in much the same way the lower portion of Okranev Time Link connects to his torso. So if I just trim up this post a little, I can wedge Tonto's torso directly to it. The Zora Link transformation form doesn't wear a cap, but his head is formed into a very similar shape. So I can use the Ocarina of Time Link Amiibo's cap to construct the rest of the head. So I'll just glue all those pieces into place. To create a smooth transition, I'm gonna fill in any gaps with some sculpting putty. I'm also gonna build up on his forehead and the bridge of his nose. I mostly apply the sculpting putty with my fingers, but for any odd angles or tight corners, I use a toothpick. And water really goes a long way to smoothing it out. I also needed to restore a small portion of Zora Link's right arm where I had to remove Tonto's armband. Zora Link's bracers also include an elbow guard. I made a few attempts at crafting these out of some scrap plastic, but it just wasn't working out, so I wound up sculpting them out of putty. While Zora Link does have a belt buckle, it doesn't look anything like Ocarina of Time's belt. I could just sand it down, but instead I'm going to very carefully cut it off with an X-Acto knife and add it to my stock of scrap parts. I'll trim away the area and create a little bit of space for the new belt that I'm gonna make out of a rubber band. For my new buckle, I'm gonna use a small section of Toon Link's Master Sword. You may remember a few episodes back, I made a legendary hero villager, which includes the Master Sword sticking out of a stump. So for the buckle, I was able to just trim off a small section of the remaining blade. Now, similar to Goron Link, Zora Link's bracers and boots, as well as his belt, is also adorned with studs. Only in Zora Link's case, they appear to be metallic. So I'm gonna use the same approach, trim some uniform circles out of a plastic spork with my leather punch, and glue them into the appropriate positions using my X-Acto knife as the applicator. I'll also add the hardware to Zora Link's gloves. I knew Zora Link needed to have this really slick, smooth, icy glue paint job. So rather than try to brush it on, I used the same approach I did with Goron Link, and for the base coat, I used spray paint. To make my job a little easier for the rest of the paint job, I kept some of the pieces separate. Painting Zora Link's eyes was a multi-step process. First, I coated the entire eye area in black, and I just kept detailing it until I got the shape right. Then I added in some blue crescents, and finally added a highlight. I'm really happy with it, and I did achieve the look that I want, but I think it's worth mentioning you could use the same approach that I did with Goron Link and trim the eye out of electrical tape. That way you could perfect the eye before you even try to apply it, and if you make a mistake, you're not gonna have to worry about trying to retouch the head. And if you did use spray paint, retouching is really inconvenient. I'm gonna paint Zora Link's bracers brown, and also his belt and his skirt. And I think it'll serve as a better base for my green. Let's just add that green on there now. Zora Link's boots are pretty similar to Ocarina of Time Link's, except instead of the cuff being separated by a buckle, it's connected. So I'll just fill that section in with some putty. I'll add the hardware, and I'll prime the boots with my light gray spray primer. For the most part, I'm pretty much just gonna restore the boots back to the color they were before. I'll start with a leather brown, then I'll spot the hardware with some silver. I'm gonna make Zora Link's neck collar out of a rubber band. I'll trim it to shape, add the hardware component with my little plastic spork circles, and then I'll paint it with a leather brown. The centerpiece of Zora Link's collar is a teardrop shape. For this, I'm gonna accept a small donation from an extra Wind Waker Toon Zelda figure who has a remarkably similar shape gem on her tiara. I'll just carefully shave that off with an X-Acto knife and glue it to the collar. Zora Link's bracer has a few different points of separation. I'm gonna use one of my daughter's really thin hair ties. I'll pin one end into place with some super glue, wrap it around, and trim it to length. As I alluded to earlier in the episode, the aspect of painting the Zora Link figure that I found to be the most intimidating was trying to transition the green into the blue. I started with the darkest part first. This is probably something I should have practiced with a little bit first. It would have been really easy to spray paint a plastic spork at the same time and hone my skills, which I encourage you to do if you have any doubts, but fortunately I got pretty lucky. I began timidly expanding my green with some very thinned out paint, and when I realized that that wasn't quite gonna work, I decided to dry brush instead. So I completely dried out my brush, added some green paint, and then brushed most of it away. Then I just slowly integrated the colors together bit by bit until it looked how I wanted. And I used the same process for the yellow at the base of the fins and also for his fin sideburns. I'll add some more silver paint to the hardware. I spent a lot of time studying the official art from Majora's Mask, and one thing I couldn't quite figure out was whether or not the two circles on Zora Link's cuff were beveled or embossed. So I came across some concept art in The Legend of Zelda Hyrule Historia, which enabled me to definitively conclude that they are in fact depressions. So I used my hand drill to create some small recesses. I painted the cuff of Zora Link's boots the same burnt orange that I used on Goron Link, as well as his elbow pads. Once I had everything painted up, the next step was to piece Zora Link back together. Just like Deku Link and Goron Link, I sealed Zora Link with some Mod Podge matte, but I also wanted his bare skin to maintain a glossy sheen, so I covered all those portions of his body in a Mod Podge gloss. Since I didn't do anything to change the shape of Ocarina of Time Link's legs, it would have been an easy enough matter to just plug him right back into the base, but since I added a leaf platform for Deku Link and a rock platform for Goron Link, I felt the strong compulsion to add some kind of water element to Zora Link. I spent a lot of time thinking about the most dynamic way to incorporate water into Zora Link's base. I looked at other Disney Infinity figures, 
I looked at various Skylander figures, but what I kept coming back around to were the Squid Amiibo from Splatoon. As far as the sculpt is concerned, the orange and the green Squid Amiibo are identical, and since I'm going to repaint it to look like water, it didn't really matter which one I used, but in this case I had the orange squid, I heated him up in some boiling water, and separated him from the base. I removed the squid and used my X-Acto knife to cut away any excess plastic. I'll prime the water with my spray gray, and then cover it in blue. Next I'll work in some thinned out sky blue to kind of give it more of a ripple effect, and then finally I'll add some really thinned out white to create some sea foam. Just as with the other two, I'm going to attach Zora Link to the platform with a screw. While Disney Infinity as a Toys to Life series might be a thing of the past, I think it's kind of awesome that they'll live on as Amiibo. Can anyone say UPGRADE? <laughs> Another thing I want to add before we wrap up here is, in-game functionality and NFC compatibility is a really important part of the customizing process to me. While all three of these Majora's Mask transformation forms contain an Ocarina of Time Link NFC chip, I was hopeful that the day would come when a more compatible NFC chip became available, and for that reason, I didn't lock the base to the platform for any of these three Amiibo. Whoa! And now we get a Majora's Mask Link! I'm really excited that Nintendo's continuing to support the Legend of Zelda Amiibo series, and I can't wait for the Majora's Mask Link Amiibo to release. Not just because it's a super cool figure that I want to add to the collection, but also because if I can get my hands on a few extra, I'd love to arm these three Majora's Mask transformation forms with a Majora's Mask NFC chip. I hope it shows how much love and care went into making these Amiibo. There's another thing I want to remind you of is that I had a lot of different pieces on hand that allowed me to use certain assets that maybe you don't have access to. But remember, the way that I did it isn't the only way to do it. In fact, you may have little components or pieces on hand that actually work better than things that I had, or there are always alternative ways. So keep your eyes open. Don't look at things for what they are. Look at them for what they can be. I don't really feel like I can overstate the importance of giving yourself the time to practice. The only way you get better at anything is training. That's how athletes get better at sports. It's how musicians master their instruments. It's how artists refine their craft. If you feel like there's a certain aspect of your custom project that's out of your reach, my absolute best recommendation is to find some inexpensive way to test out the techniques that you need. Buy some cheap used figures online or from a garage sale and just let yourself have fun. In addition to making the figures, we also made some box art in the style of the 30th anniversary Legend of Zelda Amiibo. So if you want to add those to your collection, they're going to be made available for for you in the download below. Every episode, I invite you to send your customs to be featured here on Custom Conquest, so we got some pretty good ones. Let's take a look. If you want your custom art featured here on Custom Conquest, it's really easy. All you have to do is send me a pic on Twitter. Don't forget to use the hashtag MyCCAmiibo because that's my way of being able to find it. Or you can send it directly, customconquest at gmail.com. It was really a trial to make these transformation masks, but for those of you who've played all the way through Majora's Mask and collected every mask, you know there is one more transformation mask left. And that is... <laughs> Uh-oh, sounds like somebody's about to meet with a terrible fate. You see that? You bet. What is that? Only one way to find out. Hey, listen, watch out. My hero sense is tingling. Majora's Mask. Put it on. That sounds like a very bad idea. Come on, is it the Triforce of Courage or Cowardice? Uh-oh. Don't forget the most essential character, me. But do not dare defile my majestic custom amiibo figure with your crude and hapless hand. Seek me out a master of unparalleled skill to render me with perfect precision. I'll be watching. <laughs> Are you okay? Uh, he's fine. Whoa. That was weird. Not to mention creepy. All right. Obviously, we've got something pretty epic in store for our next episode of Custom Conquest. I hope you'll join us. Until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks for, for playing, playing Dark Side Out. Hope to see you back here again for the second episode of our two-parter. It's gonna be fierce! <laughs> <laughs>